I invite you to center yourself, to prepare yourself, to be ready for worship, to light your worship candles if you have one, and we will listen to the prelude and move into a time of prayer and meditation. Thank you all for putting together some of those pictures. I have not seen many of them. It is an honor. It is a true honor. Now let us do what we have come to do, which is worship the Lord our God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Together now, on, let us join our hearts in the call to worship that you will see on your screen. The scripture says, in the seventh year, you must cancel all debts. Give one coat away. With honesty, Jesus said, Sell what you have, give that money to the poor. So in this hour of worship, may we release that which binds us. Let us worship God.
Westminster Choir. Now we want to invite our liturgist Char Wales to guide us in the prayer of confession. Let us confess our sins before God using the prayer of confession shown in your bulletin or on your screen, followed by a time of silent prayer and personal confession. Gracious God, we admit to holding tight to what we know and understand. We put you in a box to avoid the shades of gray that come with faith. You put others in boxes labeled worthy and unworthy. We put all that we have in a box and pray that we won't run out. So in this moment, we confess to holding tight to fear and greed. Forgive us for missing the point. Open our eyes to the way of Jesus, a holiness of open boxes unclenched fists, shades of gray, and holy release that comes with the good news of the gospel. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of the assurance of part. God so loved the world that God gave the only son that whoever might believe in him would not perish, but would have life abundant, rich, and eternal in him. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Alleluia. Amen. Now let us pass the peace we know in the Lord Jesus, one to another with signs of peace, with waving of hands, with smiles, and with eyes that shine with the goodness of knowing we are God's forgiven people. Pass the peace. And now let us join our hearts in the Gloria Patri. chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Listen to the word of God. Every seventh year, you shall grant a remission of debts. And this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor, not exacting it from a neighbor who is a member of the community, 
because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. From a foreigner, you may exact it, but you must remit your claim on whatever any member of your community owes you. There will, however, be no one in need among you because the Lord is sure to bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession to occupy. If only you will obey the Lord your God by diligently observing this entire commandment that I command you to today. When the Lord your God has blessed you, as he promised you, you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. You will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking the seventh year, the year of permission is near and therefore view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing your neighbor might cry, might cry to the Lord against you and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so. For on this account, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Here ends this reading from God's word. Thank you. And now we want to invite all of the children to come into the screen to gather around and let's start our time like we do every week with our special prayer. So if you could put your hands together, close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, we love you. We love you. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Help us to listen. Help us to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, boys and girls, today I want to show you um, my book bag. I am ready for this year. I am loaded down. I've got everything I need for this year of ministry. Um, and I just want to open it up for you. I've got, let's see, a, a toy from Hogwarts notebooks my ruler so all you kids getting ready for school online you got a ruler but you also i have a spare ruler got quarters and pennies in case i run out of actual bills pencils i have a large stuffed donut you do not know when you're gonna it's a bagel you don't know when you're gonna need a stuffed bagel books this is a concise history of science and invention. That ready to go. And noise canceling earphones. So the only problem is it's so much stuff that now I have no space to work. Have any of you ever brought a lot more to an adventure than you needed? To the point where then all the stuff is in your way and then you have to move it to get to where you're actually able to do the work. Um, there's a story like that in scripture and there's, a, there's a, a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. His heart is so excited to serve and follow Jesus and he says, what am I missing? And he's got all kinds of stuff with him. And and Jesus says, you're missing one thing. And he's like, what? What on earth could it be? What on earth could it be? He's got pencils. He's got everything he needs. And Jesus says, you've missed the opportunity to share, to give it away. And he tells the guy to give, to share what he has with the poor. And the man goes away. And that is how Jesus calls us to serve and share. 
we don't really know what that man did after that lesson, but we do know in our own lives that sometimes having so much stuff becomes a burden, doesn't it? It's like a big book bag that we're carrying around. And, and the opposite of that is true. When we give to someone, when we share what we have, when we lend a hand, when we give our extra, when we give from the things that we have to others, we find that we have more space, not just more space in our, in our table or on our desk, but more space in our heart. It gives back to us every time we share. One of the things that we can give, even if we don't think we have a lot to share, is our prayers. That really, that really matters. If you tell someone that you've given your prayer time to think about them. And so we're going to close our time today with the special prayer that Jesus taught us. And that is a way of giving. Because you're giving that prayer and lifting up the burdens of others. So let's put our hands together. And again, lift up that prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 through 26. It is a passage that Becca referenced in the children's message, and it is the second of our scripture lessons as we move through this special sermon series, Our Money Story, all in support of our ongoing stewardship campaign this month of October. Listen to and for the word of God as we read from the Gospel of Matthew. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, 
You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother also. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said, said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Together, let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth, and may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. With this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1967, Bob Dylan, singer, songwriter, wrote a song called, I Shall Be Released, with its chorus, any day now, any day now, I shall be released. When Dylan wrote that song, the news headlines of the day had stories of people being imprisoned all over the world. Civil rights demonstrations in the United States, protests against dictators in South America, Jews in the Soviet Union, and Christians in China imprisoned for practicing their faith. The lyrics of Dylan's song speak to those who were jailed, and especially to those who were jailed in unjustly with a word of hope, a promise of release. But there are other ways to be confined than in a jail cell. Many of us have come to experience something of that feeling during this pandemic as we've been quarantined and staying at home and not going anywhere unless we had to for work or medical care or food. And even if we do travel, the way we travel feels perhaps a bit confining. Wearing masks and face shields on airplanes, using sanitizers at, at every stop on a drive. Hotels that are as concerned about cleanliness as they are about hospitality. And you can also feel like you are a bit trapped if you're in a bad relationship, a dead-end job, a cycle of poor health, stuck in debt. There's even a kind of spiritual imprisonment in which you can find yourself unable to let go of unrealistic expectations, which brings us to the story of the encounter between Jesus and a rich young man. Three details in this story, as Matthew tells it, show me how this rich young man is perhaps imprisoned by his own assumptions. First, he assumes that eternal life is linked to good deeds. There's no imagination here that eternal life might be about a relationship with God let alone that it could be a life of grace. Rather, this rich young man only sees this as a transactional exchange. I do this, you give me that. Perhaps the man acquired the many possessions Matthew reports he had by being a shrewd businessman. So this was a kind of a natural assumption for him, or maybe 
It's just that we so often construct our lives in an exchange of goods, rather than in a sharing of and in relationships, whatever the reason. It's difficult for this young man, and experience tells me for most of us, to move beyond a quid pro quo understanding of life, even including our eternal life with God. Secondly, it seems this rich young man assumes there is a sharp divide between the life we lead now and the eternal life of which he asks. Notice here, Jesus responds to the question, but he changes the terms. Jesus responds by saying, if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. Not eternal life, mind you, but life, which reminds us that the law is given and Jesus proclaims a gospel to increase our quality of life right here, right now. Perhaps there's not such a sharp divide between this life and the life to come if we look with eyes of faith for glimpses of the kingdom right now. Third, the rich young man assumes obedience is more about a checklist to complete than it is about a discipline that can make a difference in your life. Did you see how Jesus invites the young man not just to obedience, but to perfection, which in the Greek means completion from the Greek word telos. That is, Jesus is saying the goal of a faithful life is not to check all the boxes, but to reach the intended end for which we were created. And in this case, as David Lowes points out, the command to go and to give all he has is not a requirement for eternal life, but rather is his life purpose, the goal for which he and all of us were created. Ultimately, all of life is a gift. And the only way we live into that gift perfectly, completely, is to give it away by sharing with others. Chuck Feeney is someone who knows the truth of this, and more importantly, he's lived it. This 89-year-old man co-founded the airport retail business Duty Free Shoppers and amassed billions of dollars while living a life of frugality himself. And just last month, he accomplished his goal of giving away more than eight billion, yeah, that's right, I said billion with a B, eight billion dollars given away to charities, foundations, and universities worldwide. It took four decades for his giving while living idea to fulfill its mission of giving away his fortune to big, hands-on, high-impact charity bets instead of funding a foundation upon death. And he gave it away anonymously, only going public recently as he came close to achieving his goal of giving away $8 billion. And because of his anonymous undercover giving, Forbes magazine called him the James Bond of philanthropy. He was the model for Bill Gates and Warren Buffett in their giving pledge campaign to convince the world's wealthiest people to give away at least half their fortunes before their deaths. Feeney summarized his mission this way. I see little reason to delay giving when so much good can be achieved by supporting worthwhile causes. Besides, it's a lot more fun to give while you live than to give while you're dead. Chuck Feeney came to know the power of being released from the burdens and expectations of making and spending money. Jesus invited the rich young man to release his hold on the money possessions that kept him from being free to receive the life promised by Jesus. The catch is you've got to be free to receive the gift. You've got to release the possessions and the idea that they alone can save us. Jesus invites us to practice release in our money stories, whether it's release from the burden of thinking you never have enough or release from the pressure of measuring your human worth by the size of your bank account or as with the rich young man by the amount of your possessions. Simply put, you cannot follow Jesus if you're not free to go. And Jesus is clear that God is not to be found in the fist, no matter how tightly clenched it is around possessions. God is not to be folded in your wallet 
locked behind your safety deposit bot are written in the lines of your insurance policy. That's not to say God cannot or will not work through these things, but it is to say God is not bound by them. God is not in the business of reinforcing our illusion of security. Jesus' offer here is rather radical, in fact. If you want to give it all you've got, he says, release your possessions and their hold on you. Embrace vulnerability. Experience abundant life in following me, in answering my call. So perhaps the first step in answering the question of where is God may just be answering another question. What are you holding on to? After Jesus told the rich young man all he lacked was to sell his possessions, give his money to the poor and to follow Jesus. Matthew says the rich young man went away grieving for he had many possessions. But as was pointed out by someone in our pastor's Bible study this week, what's especially sad about this is that in walking away, the man left too soon and he missed out on what Jesus said next. After the disciples heard all this and heard Jesus say it would be easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven, they asked, then who can be saved? To which Jesus said, and this is what the rich young man missed hearing, for mortals it is impossible, for God all things are possible. Yet, understand now, that Jesus does not make the statement that what is impossible for mortals is possible for God, merely so you and I can relax and do nothing. No, he said this so you can understand the importance of calling upon God to give you help in realizing that you will never understand that God is all you need until God is all you have. When I was a seminary student at Princeton, I spent a year as a chaplain at Trenton State Prison. Shabazz was a man who was an inmate there, and he had the chorus of the song, I Shall Be Released, written on the wall of his prison cell. Any day now, any day now, I shall be released. I asked him why he had those words on his cell when he knew with three felonies and no chance of parole, he had decades to go before he would be released. And he said to me, preacher, don't you know your Bible? It says there a thousand years are like a day to God. I can't use no regular calendar in here. I only got God time to go on. So any day, man, any day. Eugene Peterson's translation in the message of our lesson ends with the disciples asking, who then has any chance at all? Jesus looked at them hard and he said, no chance if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world, if you trust God to do it. My friends, may we all be released any day now, any day now. May it be so. Amen. everything can be replaced yet every distance is not near so I remember every face of every man who put me here I see my light come shining From the west unto the east Any day now Any day now I shall
shall be released This every man needs protection This every man must fall Yet I swear I see my reflection Some place so high above this wall I see my light come shining From the west unto the east Any day now Any day shall be released May God is standing here in this lonely crowd is a man who swears he's not to blame All day long I hear his voice shouting so loud Crying out that he was free I see my light come shining From the west unto the east Any day now Any day And now we come to our time of the prayers of the people. And as you've already begun doing so, if you want to add your own personal prayer that will, or a prayer of this group of Christians to the chat, let me know and we will pray that together. Particularly today, we want to pray for uh, Anne and Pete Yost. Uh, Pete Yost has had some pulmonary embolisms in his lungs after hip surgery. And we pray that he would feel deep comfort and peace. And that for his whole family. Today we give thanks for the life of Larry Crabtree, a longtime member of this church who joined the church triumphant on September 17th. A memorial service will be held at a later date, but there is a tribute wall at the Adams Green website where you can write words of thanksgiving or shouts of acclamation or prayers of condolences. We want to give thanks to God for the life of, of uh, Alan Strauser as he finished his fifth birthday and Barb and her family gave the flowers last week. And this week we give thanks for Doreen Lucas Clay and Christopher Lucas as the Albreth family celebrates them with the giving of the flowers this week. And now together, let us come before God in prayer. Lord, we haul around the weight of care and we desire to set it down before you to release these cares into your merciful hands. We pray for healthcare workers going on seven months of intensity and exhaustion with the hope that a family gets good news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for teachers pouring their heart into the screen with the hope that a child feels the spark of learning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people who are so much more than patients who are never just an illness or a name on a whiteboard, but an incredible golfer. Sure, why not? A friend, a humorist, a historian, a deacon, an elder, a friend. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer for neighbors who are so much more than their political affiliation, but a generous gardener, a French horn player, a star baker, a quiet philanthropist, a power walker, a stargazer, a complicated and precious human being. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our president, senators, congressional leaders, Supreme Court justices, local leaders, all who would bear the mantle of leadership. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For churches who are more than the sign out front, but the body of Christ, exiled for a while from the pews and grieving our songs, but also pumping out food and calling on lonesome people and dropping off casseroles, and speaking up for what is important and praying hard for peace and giving no real estate in their heart for hatred or cynicism because hope has filled every single inch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in our Trinity cycle of prayer today, for Phyllis and Jim Zukas, for Carol and Dan Aaron, and their sons, Norm and Jacob, for Brenda Adams, for Joe and Dale Adams, for brothers and sisters in Christ at Prince George's Community Church and Providence Presbyterian Church. We pray for Peter Cironi in a new battle with lymphoma. We pray for a peaceful election and healing of our nation. We pray for Susan Davies' neighbor, a first responder named Mark, recovering from COVID. We pray for nurse Amanda in her third week of illness. We pray for Olivia and Noe Flores. We pray for Jim's granddaughter, Bryn. We pray for Janet Maxwell and Rob Robinson. We pray continued healing for Janet Moore. We pray for students struggling with distant learning. We give thanks and praise for the ability to come together at 8.30 for prayer meetings and all the work that went into setting that up. We pray now in the silence for those things, Lord, that you know completely, but that we haven't typed or said aloud. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we come to the time of offering our gifts. We are in a season of stewardship, which really calls upon every day of our lives. Um, but in October, we focus on the particular stories where we reflect on the gifts God has given this church. And so today, we want to hear from Holly Courtright, who shares what it's like to have engaged with the staff of this church and some stories that are particularly meaningful for her. Before that video comes on, you all will be getting letters from the church that highlight both what you all were able to accomplish this year through the ongoing faithfulness and some of the hopes for next year. We also will be continuing these stories and invite your stories, the places where especially when we're all in our own uh, Zoom spaces. Where have you seen God at work? We've been ending all of our session meetings with that galvanizing question of where, where are you seeing God at work? Where is God calling you to serve in your life? So feel free to let us know where you have seen God healing and doing powerful ministry, especially through the life of Trinity Presbyterian Church. And Ann Yo sends her thanks for prayers. Amen. We pray continuing. Let us listen now to what one of, one of you has shared. Hello, this is Holly Courtright with a Minute for Mission for Trinity's Stewardship Campaign. This minute is all about the staff at Trinity. I cannot imagine my life over the last 19 years without the comfort and blessings of the staff. I have had pastors counsel me and my husband, Michael, when we were getting married 
as well as when we were adopting our two children. And the pastors have always been there for us through medical surgeries, tests, procedures, praying for us, and also showing us God's love. As our children have grown up in the church, youth group has become such a wonderful blessing for them in their lives, especially during COVID-19, when it's so hard to connect with others. The youth director has been wonderful meeting the children where they are and including them in new and different activities like Zoom game and movie nights, as well as outdoor charades and s'mores over the fire, all while teaching them and having them learn from each other and be friends to each other in God's love. I encourage all of you to think about the staff as you're getting ready to make your pledges for the stewardship campaign. What does the staff mean to you and how have they helped you to grow as Christians over the years and especially during this pandemic? Please support the church with your pledges as you come to Consecration Sunday on October 25th. Thank you. in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide in you this day and forevermore. Amen.